This session is titled Lower Extremity Manifestations, Manifestations of EDS. That could be an entire conference by itself. So I am definitely not going to try to go through all of the hip, knee, foot, and ankle pathology that happens in EDS patients. That's way, way more than 15 minutes. Um, what I will say as a way of disclosure is I am still definitely learning about all the EDS problems, even within foot and ankle. Um, there are some common ones. I'm really just going to talk about ankle instability here, which is the most common foot and ankle problem I see in probably, I don't know, two thirds, three quarters of EDS patients. But there's a lot of other foot and ankle pathology. There's a lot of other uh, patella, tend or, uh, patella instability, hip instability, dysplasia that is its own separate deals. So I'm going to try to quickly go through ankle instability here just to give you guys a little flavor of it um, and then let us keep going with our uh, questions and movies and all the things. So ankle instability comes in two flavors. There's acute and chronic, right? Acute is, ouch, I sprained my ankle. You know, it hurts for a while. It's a problem. Most of the time it gets better. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then we have chronic ankle instability. So the vast majority of my EDS patients fall into the chronic instability group. Makes sense. Obviously, we know there's the instability subtype. And so most of these patients develop... Uh, joint laxity and instability over time. And that's probably the number one thing that brings EDS patients in to see me. Um, and it really tends to be lateral ligament instability, which we'll touch on in a second. There are some other places that your ankle can become unstable or other joints can become unstable. Um, lateral ankle sprains are one of the most common injuries just in even non-EDS people. So ankle sprains, uh, as we all know, are incredibly common, much more so even in the EDS patients. Um, when we're talking about in ankle instability, what is the main thing we're talking about? So if you look at this little cartoon, there's the anterior talofibular ligament. This is the primary lateral stabilizer of your ankle. And that's sort of the top bar on the cartoon on the right. So it's that ATFL it's running from the fibula, that's the bone on the outside, to the talus. That's sort of the underneath bone of the ankle. Um, and when you sprain your ankle, this is the ligament that you most commonly sprain. Um, if you are an EDS patient with chronic ankle instability, this is the one most likely to be unstable. Um, there's also the CFL. That's the one sort of on the bottom part of the cartoon. Um, the calcaneofibular ligament sort of running south. Um, that stabilizes the subtalar joint and to a lesser extent the ankle. That is absolutely commonly involved in EDS patients as well. Um, if we look at the literature for normal people ankle sprains, because unfortunately, like everything else, there's really no EDS literature, um, the ATFL is more commonly injured than the CFL, but they both tend to be a problem quite frequently. Um, if you're poking on your own ankle and be like, well, where are these things you're talking about? That little purple bar at the top, uh, again, sort of the big black thing there is the fibula. That little purple part is where the ATFL is. The second purple bar sort of running south uh, or inferiorly is the CFL. Um, and those are the two places, again, that we most commonly become unstable. I'm not going to go through all these little spots on there. One other thing I will point out. So there's sort of low ankle ligaments. That's the ATFL, the CFL, the ones I just showed you. Then there's the high ankle ligaments. What is the difference with those? So there's two bones that make up your lower leg, the tibia and the fibula. The tibia is the bigger one here. The fibula is the smaller one. They're connected by something called the syndesmosis. The syndesmosis basically joins these two together. It allows them to move. Just like lots of other areas in EDS, you can injure your syndesmosis just like non-EDS patients can. Um, and so syndesmotic instability is a less common but certainly uh, real problem both in athletes, other people from other walks of life, and EDS patients. That is sort of going higher up the leg. So the way that at least on clinical exam, you differentiate a high ankle in, uh, injury or instability from low ankle ligaments is you tend to have pain going up the leg, pain when you squeeze on the bones, uh, pain when you try to move them apart from each other. So there is a difference between the high ankle ligaments and the low ankle ligaments. Um, so the mechanism for acute ankle sprains tend to be an inversion injury, meaning the foot sort of points in, and then that makes sense that the structures on the outside get hurt. Um, there are different ways you can injure your ankle that theoretically injure other structures. Again, I'll just point out that primarily you're injuring the stuff on the outside much more commonly than the stuff on the inside. Um, most of the time, you're just going to injure that ATFL, sort of the lower ankle ligaments, occasionally, at least in um, 
normal people or non-EDS people. Um, the sin is most of adult Twitter, less commonly involved, anecdotally in my EDS population. I think this is probably similar, similar that we don't have true data on that. Um, diagnosis is primarily based on history and clinical exam. So most patients, we're not jumping right to an MRI off the bat. We can make this diagnosis in clinic. Um, and that has to do with a couple uh, exam maneuvers that we'll show here. So number one, we'll just say sort of where you're, where you hurt, right? If you know anatomy, well, you can figure out what structures may be injured because you're hurt over those structures, right? Makes sense. And then there's instability testing. So the one that's probably the most valuable um, and the one that tends to be wildly positive in many of my EDS patients is the anterior drawer. Basically, what we're doing is taking the foot, holding the ankle bone, trying to move it forward. Um, and patients that are really unstable, I worry that I'm actually about to dislocate their ankle. They're that unstable. Um, so this is the number one way that clinically we determine, hey, is your ankle stable or unstable? Um, there's also something called a Taylor tilt test. This tests the CFL. That last cartoon I showed you was the ATFL. This basically, you turn the foot sort of in, and you're trying to turn the foot towards the inside, and that's a way to evaluate the CFL. Um, so these are the ways on exam that we can look for ankle instability. Um, there's also some ways you can do it on radiograph um, with stress x-rays. We don't typically have to do that. Typically, any patient that's seeing me for ankle instability, I will want to get weight-bearing x-rays. That's both to make sure that you don't have a bony injury. That also is to look at the position of your foot. Because believe it or not, there's certain things about your foot, if it's really high arch, for example, that can actually increase your risk of instability and can make treating an EDS patient or anybody else with hypermobility even more challenging. One of the reasons weight-bearing x-rays are very, very valuable. Um, other studies, so MRI can certainly be helpful if you suspect a very high-grade injury, especially to the high ankle ligaments that we talked about, um, an acute Complete injury to the high ankle ligaments typically is treated surgically, whereas typically low ankle sprains, no matter who you are, are treated conservatively because most of them will improve. Um, so for most low ankle sprains, I'm not getting an MRI. If I have a big concern about the high ankle ligaments, I will. Um, there are classifications of injury to the lateral ligaments. It's not terribly important. The main thing is, even if you tear them in half to start with, you're still going to try conservative management, bracing physical therapy, and most people will get better. Um, now, there's some that it won't, but the vast majority. Um, so when somebody has an acute ankle injury, what do we do, right? I, I have EDS, my ankle's rolled 15 times, now I just rolled it again and I'm dying, my foot looks like a beach ball. What can I do without having to, you know, come see you in the office in Charleston? Um, so boots can be helpful. Um, the boot does help protect the ankle. Um, the boot is a good way to rest the ankle. Unfortunately, boots do raise you up, and many of my EDS patients, of course, have hip problems, knee problems, back problems, all the other problems that we've touched on in this conference. So sometimes that drives my EDS patients crazy. You can get a lift for your other side. There's something called an even up that raises up the other side. That Some people find that very valuable. There are some other braces you can try if the boot drives you insane, but this is an easy thing to try. Uh, for a bad ankle sprain to get people back walking. Um, certainly physical therapy is really going to be the mainstay of treatment here, just like a lot of other problems for EDS or for anybody with an ankle sprain, right? If you have an instability problem, strengthen the tendons around that joint. That can help your dynamic instability. Um, so braces can be helpful. This is um, one option for bracing. Um, you're generally going to be taking people and trying to get their range of motion better and better. Um, whirlpool can be helpful. Contrast baths can be helpful. Um, really a focus here on range of motion and then proprioceptive training, as the last speaker talked about as well, basically knowing where your joint is in space. Um, and then we're going to be sort of progressing through a therapy protocol. Um, prophylactic, so this is somewhat controversial. Some people do like wearing bracing or doing taping or certainly physical therapy to reduce the risk of additional injuries. Um, there is not a lot of data on, uh, there's not a lot of really good data on how much braces really help or taping really helps. Certainly therapy helps more than anything else, but some people do prefer whenever they're in high risk situations to wear various braces or get taped. If you get taped by a trainer, that usually only lasts 30 to 45 minutes, so not so great for my EDS patients. <sighs> kind of beat that. Okay. Um, so for chronic ankle instability, for most of my EDS patients, what do they come in complaining of? So the most common thing is instability, right? They will say things like, when I step on anything that's at all uneven, 
my ankle rolls. All right, that's probably the number one thing that I hear. Um, pain is certainly present, but it is usually more true instability complaints, though it's certainly a big spectrum. Um, people will describe their ankle giving way or just not feeling stable. That's another very common uh, history that I hear. Um, their clinical exam, along with their history, are the two most important things. So these patients typically have a positive anterior drawer. They typically have plenty of range of motion, if not uh, sort of hypermobility, which again would make sense with this diagnosis. Um, so good motion, instability, sensation of giving way, that's your classic instability patient. Um, so how do we treat them, right? So physical therapy is number one, two, and three on here, right? Getting with a good therapist who knows what they're doing to try to get you stronger, try to get your core, all the things. Um, bracing can certainly be helpful. There's a lot of different bracing options. I'll go through a couple here quickly, but really bracing and PT are two mainstays of treatment. Um, with fair therapy, again, and most therapists should know this, uh, perineal tendon strengthening, the perineals are the tendons that run on the outside part of the ankle. The more you make those stronger, they act as a secondary stabilizer, the more you can try to mitigate the instability, um, as well as proprioceptive training, again, knowing where your foot is in space. Um, these are some of the different brace options. Again, there's a lot out there. I usually start with something lighter that would fit into a shoe. There are some bigger, bulkier braces that are an option, AFO, Arizona braces. Those are really more for uh, patients who either can't have surgery, won't have surgery, or really quite debilitated and need something very, very sturdy. Uh, most of the time, we're going with a lower profile brace if patients can tolerate it and if they find it helpful. Um, when that fails, and I get many patients who they've done therapy for a long period of time, they've tried bracing, their ankle keeps rolling, they're just tired of it. Um, surgery is typically an option. I do typically get MRI before I operate. The reason I'm getting that MRI is to look at their tendons on the outside, look at their ankle joint, make sure they haven't knocked any holes off their cartilage, make sure their syndesmosis is unstable. So the MRI for me is not really making the diagnosis. I've already made the diagnosis in the office, but it's helping me know exactly what I'm going to do in surgery because sometimes the surgical plan is uh, tailored but depending on the MRI and what other problems they may have at the same time. Um, just to show you sort of what we're looking at here, so the big black thing that looks like an hourglass here, and this is an axial T2 sequence, meaning bone is dark, um, fluid is white. The big thing in the center that looks like an hourglass, hourglass is the talus. That little smaller thing on sort of the bottom center is the fibula. And the anterior talofibular ligament, that ligament that we're talking about, the one that's most commonly injured, normally looks like this nice black line. So you can see on the front part, there's basically a black thing going from the hourglass to the fibula. That's what this ligament looks like. So if you're looking at it on MRI, if you want to see, hey, what is my doctor looking for? That's what it should look like. And in most EDS patients, it's either gone or very stretched out. Um, so my typical surgical treatment for ankle instability starts with ankle arthroscopy. So I always want to look in the ankle joint. Oftentimes there's scar tissue that causes pain. There's extra bone that, that forms and causes pain because of the recurrent instability. I want to treat that and get rid of that pain generator. Then I'm doing something to tighten up the lateral ligaments. Uh, in my EDS patients, I add a little augmentation, but we're certainly redoing the ligaments. And then I'm typically looking at their perineal tendons. Uh, there's a a higher rate of perineal tendon tears or other pathology because as the ankle becomes unstable, those perineal tendons are trying to fire and become a secondary stabilizer and they're getting worn out too. So I've certainly had EDS patients where they come in, their ankle's unstable, and oh, by the way, they've actually ruptured one of their two tendons and we need to do some work to try to get one of those back to where they need to be. So we do know from the literature that patients that undergo this modified brostrum, which is sort of the, the center thing I talked about, the heart of this surgery, which is tighten up the ligaments on the outside, the three predictors of a poor outcome are 10 or more years of instability, associated arthritis, or generalized joint hypermobility. My EDS patients typically all are three, many of them fit one as well. So we know that, you're higher, that EDS patients are higher risk because we can't truly address their hypermobility, we can only try to get things back to where they should be. Um, so for me with my EDS patients, I tend to add something called suture tape augmentation. Um, so this is sort of the classic Brostrom procedure where basically you're putting these little plastic anchors in the fibula and then tightening the, the ligament down. Um, I and others have gone to adding basically this additional band of suture that goes from the fibula to the talus. It's that little blue thing that you can see in this cartoon. The whole idea is I, I want a belt and suspenders, right? We know that patients with EDS and other giant, joint hypermobilities, their tissue is not normal. 
And even doing this surgery, I can't make their tissue normal. I can try to tighten it up, but we know it's going to stretch out some. So you want to add whatever you can to reduce your risk of recurrence. And this has been my practice and others. And anecdotally, I think it makes a big difference in reducing the risk of recurrence. Now, it's not zero. There are people in the room that I've had to redo. Uh, but it is certainly less than if you don't add this stuff. Hmm. Oh, there it goes. Um, so again, this is the ankle arthroscopy, two little cameras in the ankle joint. This is what you see when you're in there uh, in that bottom cartoon. Talus is sort of on the bottom, tibia is in sort of the top right, fibula is on the top left. That's the syndesmosis where they come together. Um, again, this is sort of a normal brostrum procedure, those two little plastic anchors in the fibula tightening up the ligaments. This is adding that suture tape augmentation over the top as well. Again, belt and suspenders. Um, for me, this is now patient surgery. Most of the time, surgery is hour, hour and a half. Um, most of my patients get a block preoperatively. That allows us to do less sedation in the operating room. Usually, we don't have to do a general anesthetic. Um, it helps take away pain for the first day, day and a half, so that usually your worst day for pain is the day of surgery. That kicks you down the road uh, a day or two, which tends to help. Um, typically, I'm keeping people off it for two weeks in a splint. If you don't know what that is, that's what's sh shown in this little cartoon. It functions like a cast. So no walking on it for two weeks, and then I let people walk for four weeks in a cast. Uh, at the six-week mark, I really get you going. We go into a boot. We start PT. You get out of the boot as soon as you feel comfortable. Most people, that's typically around seven or eight weeks from surgery. I will typically green light people for running, jumping, hopping if you do that three months. Truthfully, most people are usually four to five months return to that sort of activity. Um, for my high-level athletes, you're usually back to the play somewhere between four or six months after something like this. Um, and the biggest risk of surgery is recurrent instability. Again, we know our EDS patients are going to be higher. Um, but a, as I've talked about, there's things that we can try to do to mitigate that risk. But we know we can't ever make it zero. Um, and with that, so ankle instability is really common in the overall population, much more so in the EDS patients. Usually this is not a difficult diagnosis, but you want to see somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, and surgery is appropriate in patients who have failed physical therapy, bracing, all the things. Um, with that, I appreciate your time, and I'll let us move on to the next group. And feel free to email me at any time. Thanks, y'all.